Hi, I'm Deborah from the Property Frontline. I'm John Gilnovich from Real Property Manager. And I'm Ken from Avora Finance. Thanks for joining us today. And we're Property Mythbusters, where we talk about contradictions and misleading information in the property space. And for the next 10 minutes, we'll be discussing, is it the, the myth of it's hard to tell if there are issues with property? Uh, is, did I get that one right, Deb? It's hard to check property faults. It's hard to check property faults. Thanks. So, uh, you know, going from a lender's perspective, because I kind of work, being a mortgage broker, I work with, with the lenders. I'll probably say that the take with, from a valuation point of view, that's probably when a lender will flag any potential issues that they have with the property that you're purchasing. Although you can't really preempt that. So you basically sign the contract of sale during that cooling off period however long you've got it for. If you can get the bank to assess the loan, they'll generally ask for the contract of sale, go through it and and do their own due diligence checks. But their checks are probably much more different to the checks that you would do. The bank's perspective is whether they can sell that property uh, or if there's any going to be major issues with selling that property should you default on the mortgage. If you're buying an owner-occupied, might be slightly different. The the problems that you're looking at are more day-to-day, you know, uh, noise levels, things like that. Uh, which are outside the scope of what the lender's looking for. And Deb, you mentioned that it was interesting because in terms of finding faults, there are a lot of people buying property that have a lot of challenges and issues. Is that right? Or It's very, very popular. Yeah, people are being more and more drawn to properties that are almost uninhabitable and they'll really compete at, and often pay more for properties like that because they have the dream of what they're going to put on that property. And I was wondering whether it's really starting to become an issue with the banks. Yep. With that, probably I haven't seen anything come up. I can see two ways that the lenders could approach, you know, that particular scenario. One would be a more conservative approach where they might, uh, when they go to do the inspection um, and have a value, actually go through the property, you know, deem the, property inhabitable because you know you just can't put someone in there and and live in it without extensive renovations some Mm -hmm. lenders might view that i can see some lenders viewing that as a land purchase as opposed Mm -hmm. to you know property so the need to have the the building the, the, the house restored to a point where you can actually have people in it, whether it be tenants or, or the person living in it. Um, the other side of the spectrum probably would be more of a higher risk appetite where they say, because you're buying it at, let's just say $700,000, the comparable sales are around about 700,000 for beat up property like that. The bank's perspective could be, yeah, look, that's fine. Regardless, if you do default, it seems like it's selling at that price. So we'll do it as, as is. I could see, I could see them going both ways with it. And that's probably where our product research would kind of come into place. If that was the particular scenario, clients were looking for that type of property. Uh, that's something I would include in the product research and ask, uh, raise a question with lenders and see if they've got any issues with it. So there's not too much else I probably could to talk about on this particular topic, but just how lenders would view potential issues, but they may be different to what owners are looking for or investors are looking for. Hmm. Okay. We might have some questions later. <laughs> sure. Good on you, Ken. Uh, yeah, so from, from a, a rental perspective, and I'll, I'll, I'll put myself in the, uh, in the tenant's uh, shoes, obviously, when you're out inspecting uh, rental properties out there. Yep. Okay, so when, you're, when a prospective tenant is walking through a, a rental property, the process is actually really quick, and it lasts for about 10 to 15 minutes during the during inspection time and there may be a lot of people around at the same time as you uh, and of course the property is could be furnished with the current tenant living in the property generally get a second chance or come back so for a tenant to pick up on any signs of defects as such is it's really really difficult and so about two years ago because of all the disputes around sort of the repairs and maintenance of properties and the state that they're in the New South Wales government decided to roll out what's called uh, minimum standards of, of rental property. Now, minimum standards of rental property has become a thing all around the country now. So pretty much nearly every single state in Australia is now or has rolled out the minimum standard legislation. 
what is that exactly does that mean? Well, the minimum standards on, on a rental property, if you're the owner of that property, uh, revolves around seven principles, if you like, of what that property or the state of that property. Uh, now, very quickly, we're looking at that the property is structurally sound, that it has adequate natural or artificial light in every room, that there is adequate ventilation in the property, that the property is supplied with uh, gas, electricity, and, and adequate lighting and heating, that there's adequate drainage and plumbing, and you are connected to a, a water supply and, that, and you're able to drink that water, wash in it or clean in it, uh, and so forth. And the last one being that the bathroom facilities, including the toilet and washing facilities, are adequate and, uh, and, and private. So with that in mind, even if things go wrong, after you sign the lease and you've moved into the property, a tenant is now well protected by the legislation. Uh, and that means that they can call on the landlord uh, or their agent to upgrade or service or repair any of those sort of items that fall into those, those categories, which is now seen fair and reasonable. Okay, so it doesn't mean that, oh, sorry, I've ran out of space and I need to, you know, build the uh, build a second room or the property came with it, didn't come with air conditioning, all of a sudden you want air conditioning uh, on, your, on your wish list. It's not, it's not about that. It's about the absolute minimum um, requirement of what is fit, fit for purpose and, and, and making that property habitable. And there are no health and safety issues. Those two things are really important. The health and safety of that property is not affecting the tenant's health. For example, at, uh, big area of dispute is rising damp uh, in old homes and sometimes even in strata, strata properties, the rising damp can affect someone's health to the point um, of possible death from mildew. So the tenants rights there in relation to moving into property that may not be up to scratch is that they can um, seek a remedy from, from the landlord as far as getting the property to that minimum standard level and the laws are absolutely uh, black and white on that front, uh, that uh, it, it, it must be fit and habitable in the state of reasonable uh, repair and have all those seven principles ticked off uh, for that particular rental property. So that's what it looks like for uh, when you're a tenant out there in the marketplace trying to uh, rent a property. It's kind of, I guess, in a sense, they, the government took the stance that they want to end the slum lord and the slum property out of the marketplace. Uh, so that's where that would come from. Um, I wonder how many tenants know about that, though. <laughs> I guess it's all about communication. I think Fair Trading did a fair and reasonable uh, rollout of the minimum minimum standards, you know, through their communications and through the, through the property stakeholders uh, as well. And look, in my day-to-day -day experiences, the educated tenant really knows their rights around this and of course if it's someone new to the country and there, there might be a new immigrant they don't really understand the law as well there's a thing called you know the tenant tenants unions out there who now administer uh you know the tenant legal advocacy on that front and so go into bat for the tenants if there are any um you know legal uh, strongholds from either the, you know, the landlord or the tenant. So it's, uh, the law is there now. Uh, there has been many precedents in, in the tribunal now that uh, basically say that you've got to do the right thing and you've got to provide a property that's adequate purpose. Okay, that sounds good. All right, I will jump in now and just share my screen. Yeah, so in relation to when you're buying property, it can be difficult to check property faults, but when you're buying, there's a number of different opportunities you will have to identify issues. I have been working on a little course to help people just really be efficient with their purchasing. And of course, you know, it's really important to identify key issues because it will have an impact on value. But we believe that these levels of checking will get you the best outcome. So we advise people to check properties 
prior to viewing. So there's so many tools now online where you can check properties out and identify key issues. Then at the first viewing, so that's where you've walked in and you're on the property And as John said, you might be there with quite a few people. So you need to have a bit of a plan of how you're going to assess the property. If you're lucky in this market, you'll get a second viewing before you actually make an offer. And then, of course, there's the professional inspection, so where you get a building and pest inspection prior to buying. But if you're buying in a private treaty kind of arrangement, not at auction, so where you're just negotiating directly with an agent, we would normally do the professional inspection after you've got agreement on price and during the cooling off phase. And then, of course, you check it again after you prior to settlement. So I have got a 10-point approach to it, but I will just go through it quickly as you would have to if you're viewing a property on the open market. So it's really narrowing uh, or zeroing in the main things that you can check as an individual. So windows and doors, uh, keeping your eyes and ears peeled for damp or mould. So listening to the questions that other people might be asking while you're on site Uh, and then following up, getting clarification with the agent. Have a look around at the ceilings. Try to turn on a few taps. Check out the sinks. So you will see some people really going at it and looking underneath the sinks. Um, I have seen people, like, giving the pipe works a bit of a shake. I mean, really, you don't need to go too far. All you can do is really just give it a bit of a visual check Have a look at the hot water system, which will normally be outside. You want to see how old it is. Try a few light switches. You'll usually see at an open, all the lights will be on. So that's a good indication. If the lights are off, it's best to ask the question with the agent. Have a little bit of a look around at the roof, uh, the guttering and the drain pipes and then pay attention to noise levels and smells. So that would be what I would do if I was just having a really quick look at a property just to identify some key issues and note these down, ask questions of the agent and then follow up once you're off-site because, you know, it's a very fast market and you've got to make these judgment calls very, very quickly. But if everything looks okay or you can identify some issues, then it should really just impact the price that you offer. But as to the myth that it's hard to check property faults, it's not really that difficult. And then you would use your building and pest inspector to really do a deep dive. But... These days, we've got so many tools and fixes, even if you need to address foundations, address the stability of a frame, like a house frame. While it's something that you need to pay attention to, it's not something that is like a dark art like it used to be. Is there anything we need to, anything else we need to talk to talk about in relation to that? One thing I'm probably wrong with there is uh, probably solicitors because they're going to go through the contract of sale as well to see if there's anything um, strange, unusual um, with the particular transaction. So that could also crop up um, to help, um, you know, identify, you know, if there's any potential issues with a property. That's always one that's that I didn't include because it's outside of credit, but uh, I would recommend a pest and building inspector and the, and the solicitor to help out on that on that front. That sounds good. You know, Deborah, just a question. Have, have you experienced any kind of legal situation, like legal comeback from a buyer after they've done the report and, and sort of, you know, nothing's come up or they've done the pre-inspection re- report, which is, as I understand it, is compiled by the selling agent of that property? What if they miss something pretty, pretty crucial and, 
and this is post settlement, something's come up. Is it too late? Is it too late by then after the property settled? Settlement. For any repercussions? Post settlement, yes. There's nothing you can do. But prior to settlement, the way we approach a purchase is that if a building and pest inspection hasn't been provided to us, we would make our assessments, put in our price, do our negotiation, and then during the cooling period, which in some states can be 14 days, in New South Wales it's usually only 5 to 10 days, Victoria's the same, and so you really need to get your building and pest inspection done during that cooling phase and then if a significant issue is identified by a professional inspector, then we would go back and say this issue has been identified, it's going to cost 10000 for it to be rectified, so therefore we would need to discount that from the original price we negotiated. And, and that happens quite often. I've got lots of stories about that. Mm-hmm. So but to negotiate a price down, after you've already got an agreed contract, you really need the evidence. So you need the building and pest inspection, you need quotes from professionals for how much it's going to cost to mitigate. Repair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's up to the vendor to say, no, like I've been in a situation where we did a building and pest inspection and we found that one whole third of the house had been added on and it wasn't approved by council. And so it was a pretty big deal. I had to negotiate an extra 100000 off the price. In the end, the vendor said no and so the deal was ended, but then that property stayed on the market. It continued to be an issue and they had to sell it less money than they were hoping to get anyway. So if you're a vendor, if you're a property owner and you're trying to sell your property, it's best to get a building and pest inspection done up front so that when people are buying, they know what they're buying and they can give you a price. Yeah, so the key key message being that it needs to be done up front. It's too late after you own it, after settlement. It's just too late. There's no comeback. So you need to get all this sorted out pre-exchange, I guess, not even pre-settlement, pre-exchange. Before the, not not exchange, before the end of the cooling period. If it's an auction situation, then you don't have a cooling period and it needs to all be done prior to anticipation. Mm -hmm. One thing I'd probably mention as well, if there are any changes to the contract price, specifically the contract price, because I do know there's other ways of negotiating these discounts in um, to property transaction but if if the contract price ever changes let your broker or your lender know because that will be picked up prior to settlement and it could mean that you you miss settlement had a situation once where it was was only renegotiated by i think like you know a few thousand not not much and it was a race to to the end managed to turn it around in a couple of days but if there's any changes to the contract price uh because it affects the lvrs and the calculations that the lenders have used it could be a, a a big issue from a lenders from a loan application point of view. Yeah, and that's why typically we would never change the contract price. It's just organised as a discount when it comes to settlement. If there's, we need to adjust the actual price. It means that the buyer doesn't pay the price we agreed. It means that the vendor covers any shortfall because nobody wants to go back and re-sign all those contracts and do all that. that. <laughs> but, yeah, all righty. Well, that was fun. Very so, good. yeah, thanks very much for joining us today at the Property Mythbusters. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me at propertyfrontline.com.au, john at realpropertymanager.com.au or ken at avora.com.au. It is done, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, it All is right. done, Bye. Right. See you next time. See you next time.